everybody for coming. I see that uh, Professor Ho Shen is here from Beijing, and uh, I do mention her because uh, years ago, I was invited to Beijing, and I was supposed to give a seminar about a city. It was a city seminar, and um, I said, yes, of course I'll do it, and I gave them names of cities that I'd like to talk about. And Ho Shen said, no, we are doing the American cities. You have to do a German city. And so I gave a talk back then, probably a very long talk, uh, about Munich. And somehow this one goes back to the Chinese talk many years ago. Uh, it's not my research area, but uh, I always think it's really important to try to understand the place where you're coming from. Um, understand everything that has to do with it, from temperature and climate to geology. I think we, we live from the resources. And uh, I will tell you today that Munich can only be understood because of its environment. And even though it's called the environmental history of Munich, it's really an environmental history of Munich and its hinterland. You see this here. You see the, this is Germany's highest mountain, the Zugspitze. And it's a typical photograph. You hardly ever see Munich like this. It's done with a telephoto, and it makes you believe that the Alps are just around the corner. <laughs> but they are relatively close. The other thing you see is most of the houses are not very high. Um, I don't see. Uh, yeah, here is the tower of the. Oops, this is wrong. Back, somehow back. Um, this is the tower of the church, the Frauenkirche, which is 100 meters high. And for the longest time, until I think 1980. Uh, no building, maybe with one exception, was higher than Frauenkirche. And there was even a rule that it, there was a law that this should not be the case. Munich people were so conservative, they didn't want the American skyline. There was the first high building, it was built in 1929. It was the technical uh, town hall. And it was a high building. And there was such an outrage. And they called it the American building. And you, you may know that. Germans call Frankfurt a mine, Manhattan. <laughs> mine is the river, Manhattan, and it's, uh, it's sort of derogative, especially in Bavaria. People think they don't like skylines. Okay. So this is what I'm going to talk about: climate and geography, Munich and its Alpine history. Munich has been called the Italian city, has been called the northernmost Italian city, and um, I can tell you there are over 360 Italian restaurants in Munich, more than in Bologna or in Florence. Uh, but really what I'm going to talk about is, is liquids. Really what I'm going to talk about is water. I think water defines the city. Water and stone and whatever grows here. Um, and then I'm looking at two sites that you all know about, English Garden and Olympic Park, and I will look at the differences between the two of them from a landscape architectural viewpoint. And the last thing is like a catch -all. I'm just talking about all sorts of things that came to my mind. <laughs> I have to tell you that I have a, a lot of slides, 60 slides, and I just made up that um, table of content a minute ago. <laughs> so it will, these are not exactly chapters, but these are things that you will know, know more about after this talk. We are on this street, actually, we're exactly here. Here is uh, the Sieges Tor. This is the English Garden. It's one of the largest urban parks in the world. And um, what is important here is the river. It's not a huge river. It's the Isar River. And it's here you can see the canal. Um, this down there, this way is south. So you would be heading, what you saw in the other picture would be that where you are. You are the Alps. <laughs> this is north, and you can see it's relatively flat. Munich is here. The biggest city in, in Germany is Berlin. The second is Hamburg. And then, what is this? The Ruhr area, yeah. The industrial area with like 10 million inhabitants. So Munich is relatively small, but it's the third largest in terms of individual cities. This is Nuremberg as the other Bavarian city that is larger, and Lake Constance uh, at the border of Switzerland. This is the Czech Republic. 
So you can see here, basically, uh, the, the brown is the urban, and um, then there's the blue is the water. Temperature, I put that in because today it's hot. And uh, you may think that Munich, some people th say, oh, it's in the south of Germany. It's a, it's a hot city, and it does get hot. But we, by the way, we also get a lot of precipitation. It's a myth that we have, that it's like uh, there's no rain in southern Germany. But uh, the, the average temperature in, uh, in Bavaria is uh, not that high. It's actually warmer in some parts of Britain and much warmer, of course, in Italy and the south here and much colder in the north. What I find intriguing is this... Um, this population density map, because you can see Germany, which is, this is Germany. Uh, Berlin is also part of Germany, but the West Germany is really, really highly populated. And it's, uh, it's one of the biggest challenges for Munich, the high population density. Um, here you can see in Bavaria, you've got, this is Munich, but many parts have hardly any population. Dark blue means highly populated. So Munich has a concentration of the population. Whereas at, this, at the border, for instance, to the Czech Republic, where this was the Iron Curtain, uh, there is very, this is the Iron Curtain. So along here, there is very low density. Um, this is even more, this is an old map, I'm sorry, but it still gives you, it shows you how the uh, population has been developing, is currently developing. The former GDR is here. And the map doesn't show you the former GDR, even though it looks like it. The map shows you the area where the population is decreasing. So in eastern Germany, in the former GDR, with the exception of Berlin, the population is decreasing drastically. Whereas the one place on this map where the population is increasing dramatically, the only place is Munich and its surroundings towards Upper Bavaria. And this, you know, it's increasing very much because it used to be in the south of Munich, it used to be very, very rural. And until World War II, it was not that big of a city. But here you see that the demographic development of Munich. You can see that there was hardly any development. It's like the hockey, hockey stick curve of the climate. You know, it shows industrialization. So uh, it's all the same. It doesn't matter whether it's, uh, you know, um, mining or... Uh, climate. So the, the wars brought down the population dramatically. And then um, it increased. This is 1972, somewhere. 1972 was the Olympics. I can show you on the next one better. You see, 1972 was the highest point. After that, it went down, remained like this, even went further down, 1990s. But in recent years, it has gone up dramatically. And so uh, Munich is the fastest growing city in Germany, of the big cities. We are close to 1.8. I think we have about 1.7 million now. We had 1.2 in the uh, mid-1990s. So it's gone up by 5 million, which is a lot. I will tell you something. It's kind of complicated, but maybe I can, maybe it's important to know. OK, Munich. In the, in the early 1970s, there were zoning laws. And most communities, small communities were dissolved. So small villages were not allowed to survive. They had to, they, they were, it was called Eingemeindung. They, were, they became part of larger communities. There's new zoning, so there would be only one town hall for a larger community. It had to, be, had to have 5,000 inhabitants. There's a little community south of here where the mayor decided they only had 2,500 inhabitants. They didn't want to be part of the next uh, city over of Starnberg, so they decided to quickly build uh, a suburb to in, the, in this old village with 2,500 people so they would not be part of Starnberg. Mm -hmm. But Munich, in, in contrast to most of the big cities, did not have a lot of suburbs that became part of the city proper. So um, some people think that Munich is green. Munich is the least green city. You saw the English Garden, you would think, OK, it's the largest urban park in Germany by far, but perhaps the largest in Europe. But it's not the city limits. Within the city limits, 
there is a lot of population outside in other districts that were not, that did not in the 1970s become part of Munich. It's green. You have a green belt, which is not part of Munich. A lot of forests around it. And this has many, many implications. For instance, for ecology, you know, you need to compensate. When you build here, you need to show, if you, if you build on new ground, you need to show that you're compensating for building up and you don't have that area. It's much easier if you have a big city like Berlin. Berlin is so much larger than Munich. Okay. I don't see you have questions. You don't, if you don't understand it, let me know. Here um, you see Bavaria, and white means snow. Um, the Alps, Lake Constance, this is Bavaria. Um, this is the Danube River that flows into this Austria. It flows into Austria, the Czech Republic. It flows down to the Black Sea. It starts somewhere there in the Black Forest in the west, goes all the way to the southeast. So you could, in theory, with a dinghy, go from the Black Forest to the Black Sea. Um, I once, we once, uh, once interviewed a doctoral candidate, um, and I think one of the reasons, maybe I shouldn't say that on camera, one of the reasons why we, sh we chose her was because she was going down with a dinghy from uh, from here, from the border, from this border, uh, to uh, Budapest, and I thought this was this was. So she did the interview on a camping site next next to her dinghy. Uh, you can impress. It's not so easy to go down the Danube, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to that. Knowing that the Danube is close by is really important for Munich, even though Munich is not on the Danube. Water is important. Munich is at the Isar River. It's about here, I think. And um, there are all these glacial, these are all glacial lakes. Um, some of them were much larger. This one was much larger originally. This one is the deepest. Doesn't really matter. Originally, when the Alps, imagine these are the Alps. When the Alps raised, um, the water, the glaciers went all in one direction from south to north, this way. Yeah? And so they should all be like this. But the, you see the Isar, and some of these rivers go the other way. So because, when, uh, because at, at one point in time, uh, the stones tilted, tilted uh, to the east. So originally it was all like this, and all of a sudden it moved like that. So some of the rivers later on moved like that. So originally they were all flowing from south to north. And they are the most important connection. And before there were roads, uh, they were the way to move around, obviously. South of Munich, the landscape looks like this. These are drumlins. I don't know whether you've heard of those uh, drumlins. You can see they all go in the same direction. These are the traces. You can see, you can still imagine how the ice was pushing uh, the gravel or, uh, forward. And um, so you can see this just south of Munich. If you go through this landscape, it's a beautiful landscape with a lot of hills, but the gravel is not far below the grass. So there's, uh, the earth is not that great for agriculture. You can see a drum in here. This is how it works. It, uh, the ice moves in one way and then it's, so it has this shape. Um, Munich is at the end, this is where the uh, big ice sheets ended, basically. So this is why it's lower here and why it's, it's, a, it's a plain, a level plain. You can see here that it's lower. These are still the Alpine lakes and um, the Isar flowing through Munich and then into the Danube. That's important to remember. The cities of Augsburg and Freising were really, really important originally. Munich was absolutely not important in the Middle Ages, but these two cities were important. And now Munich is the capital. The university was not originally in Munich. Ludwig Maximilian's university was originally in Landshut. It moved at a much later point to Munich. What does it mean that there's gravel? I mean, what does it mean that, you know, with, with that the ice sheets moved gravel forward? Uh, you see here what it looks like south of here uh, you you can use the gravel what would you use the gravel for buildings building this is the problem with circular economy in the building uh, as we have find every time the uh, gravel no one want to have a secondary raw material so this is the problem we have 
Yeah. Yeah. This is the former head of the uh, waste uh, management of, 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 uh, of Munich, and he knows he would prefer to use other materials, recycled materials, over always going into uh, into the mountains and taking gravel out. So you use it for building, like road construction, but it's also you probably have it in your have it in your mouth every day because in many toothpastes, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, also in porcelain. We make uh, you make porcelain from gravel. But it's not very, it's not like gold. <laughs> if you've got a lot of gravel, it doesn't make you rich necessarily. It's not what made uh, Munich rich. At the same time, it was, it's important that there's gravel because you can dig down. So this is in Ottobrunn. Um, it's south of Munich, not so far south. And you can see that you can actually dig down. And I want you to remember that, that you can dig down because it has an impact on what can be done in Munich. It's different from the very rocky landscape in the Alps. That is hard. It's different in so many ways. Um, even when it comes down to Chernobyl nuclear stuff that uh, you know doesn't sink in that much in in the Alps, vegetation plays also a role. But um, this is uh, the oldest fountain that we still have today. Uh, it's in the castle in the residence. Uh, this is one in um, Grasbrunn. So if you have a lot of uh, whenever it says Brunn, which means well, uh, it's an ancient village that was built around. A well, Grasbrunn, Otterbrunn, etc. It was just, I mean, you needed water in order to build a, a village. So I should say, I should go back. So this is south of Munich. Remember, south of Munich is where the ice sheets were. South of Munich is where the hills are. South of Munich gets more and more rocky the further south you go. South of Munich, uh, you can dig down in the gravel for water. And um, so you, the, the, but the gravel field was, was still relatively deep the further south you go. And north of Munich, it's very different. And so you have a problem with flooding. Um, so you have to drain it. Um, the gravel plain is thin. It often gets flooded and you have canals like that. Originally, I mean, you look at this picture on the left, or the two pictures there on like mm -hmm. mythology, mm -hmm. but also reality for a very long time. Uh, in this area, you, you cannot have crops. You cannot have wheat, corn, let alone asparagus. <laughs> but <laughs> asparagus is quite a bit north of Munich. Um, uh, remember, the ice sheets are pulling the gravel down, and where the gravel ends, some some dust sits down, and it becomes sandy. And that's where the asparagus grows north of here. But here, people who lived in these parts of, of Bavaria were poor. Uh, they typically had a couple of cows. Some of them would have chicken, and some of them would do uh, homework, like do something handicraft or some or other things that would make them money. Until the 19th century, and you saw that curve with industrialization, people moved from the villages to the big cities. They moved away from these areas, with the exception of tourism. And tourism started, what, what started tourism? What made people go uh, in the 19th century, somewhere in, after the mid of the 19th century, to the south of Bavaria? You can imagine it. Why could people all of a sudden move down there? They didn't go on these rivers. Train. The railroad brought <coughs> stuff. And um, I mean, the ra railroad to Garmisch, for instance, I think was built in 1865, something like that. So all of a sudden, you could go down to Lake Starnberg, Lake Amma, uh, Lake Amma was later, Lake Starnberg. And actually, it was interesting. Uh, um, I stand in this, on the platform every day on, the, um, on this line, and I can see that the railroad engineers were actually looking at the highest mountain. The, the tracks go exactly towards the highest mountain, which is Garmisch and the Zugspitze. Um, and this was done for tourism. And there were a lot of British tourists in the 19th century, but also a lot of, you know, the Blue Rider, for instance, uh, the famous artists, they settled in Upper Bavaria in this beautiful landscape that was, bef I mean, you can consume the, land the landscape aesthetically. You can also, 
uh, use it, but for agriculture it's unusable. So either as a tourist or as, as a painter, it has a value that did not exist before. And if you can easily go there, uh, you, you, if by train, people discovered this. I come originally from southwest Germany. There are a lot of people from Stuttgart, including the first good architects in Bavaria. Um, well, I have to revise that later on. But, uh, this, but it's interesting, in, in the place where I live, uh, that, that you see it's very traditional Bavarian architecture until somebody from Stuttgart moved in and built a very different style of architecture, but also um, a lot of uh, industrialists. I, maybe you know Bosch? Bosch, famous industrialist. He moved to that area. He actually experimented with uh, m the Moors and he thought that he could solve the energy crisis by using the, the, the turf, mm. which is also in some parts of the south of Munich. So he was also from Stuttgart, so a lot of Stuttgart industrialists or from other parts would move in, artists moved in after the railroad came. A lot changed, imagine, it was also cheap to buy, to get uh, wine from uh, Austria to kill every bad vineyard that existed. The, Wine was really horrible here, so it was good that the train came. At one point, the extension of Bavaria was enormous for a very short time. In, uh, in 952 to 976, it actually went all the way down. It excluded, you'll be happy to know that, uh, the people from Venice were here. It excluded Venice, but it was just around there, so um, Bavaria was close. Um, so this Carinthia, this became Carinthia, uh, was taken away from, from Bavaria in 976. I'm showing this because of the Italian connection. Why is Munich called the uh, Italian city? When I, when I came to, from Washington to, to uh, Munich, I, I, I asked, why should I go to Munich? I don't know what I should like about Munich. There were two answers. One answer was, Munich is great because it's not Bavaria. And people who said that were saying it's not conservative. Like in the countryside, it's a city. And uh, we currently have a red-green government. So um, this is what they, they, they were saying. Munich is a progressive city, where the country, whereas the countryside is conservative. Some other people said, Munich is great because you're immediately in Italy. And that's also true. I mean, you can get uh, there are several trains that go without a stop I mean, not without a stop, but without having to change from here to Venice. So there's still this connection to Italy. Um, you can see it here. There are some, um, the red are the provincial borders. That's not so important. But what is interesting are these, uh, the, um, the yellow roads. You see them often along the rivers here, along the Salza to Linz, along the Danube, all along here along the Danube all the way. These yellow roads go south. I don't know, do you have this expression in, in, uh, in English? All roads go to Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they all go to Rome. Uh, so Romans were road builders, par excellence. And where's Munich? Munich is here, it's not existent. I told you before Augsburg was existent uh, and Rising is I can't see that now, but the Romans had these big cities. They, they, they had, I think some of the oldest parts are here in Augsburg. And in general, you can. This is why you can't underestimate waterways. If you want to understand how how a country is settled here, a thousand years ago in the Middle Ages, um, it starts in the valleys. There are monasteries. The monasteries, it's not that they pray all the time. They, they, what they do, they cultivate the land. Uh, they often autark, they have fishing rights, or they uh, have their own cattle, they make their own cheese, blah, blah, they have their own crops. And, uh, and then villages are formed and they are dependent. They have to give stuff to uh, the, the monastery, to the abbot, etc. But then um, they move slowly upwards in the mountains. So the higher up, the more likely it is that the, the villages are, are more recent. The oldest villages and towns you can see are all along. You see how many there are. These are all, uh, some of them are Christian, some of them are um, earlier Roman. All these spots are Roman. So the, all these round spots show you that the Romans were already there at the rivers. What is this? Okay. 
What? Trunks. Trunks, yeah? Yes. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> what? What could it be? It doesn't matter where it is. No, it's not. But it's actually the Folgensee, uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's one of these artificial lakes uh, that they use. Uh, but no, this is a 2003 year old road, a Roman road. And you can see it when they, because it's in a lake, that, in an artificial lake that, uh, where, the, where they can control the water level. They need to control it uh, because of flooding and for other reasons. So you can still see the relics of these roads. And there's, they're rebuilding these roads like this. this is, they were built with wood. There were 90,000 kilometers of major roads and 300 kilometers of secondary roads, Roman roads. Now, why is Munich sometimes called the Italian city? Because it's almost identical. This is, which is Munich? This is Munich. And this is Florence. This is Munich, and on the left is Florence. <laughs> when you walk down Ludwigstraße, when you walk down Prince Regentstraße, the monarchs of the 19th century, they loved Italy. You can also go to many other Bavarian places with high towers and, I mean, the, the steeples of German, of Bavarian churches, the paintings, the sculptures, sculptures came from Italy. They were the real, um, yeah. This is, a, again, it's almost the same thing. They modeled the church on the left in Munich after Sant'Andrea della Valle in Rome. So Munich doesn't only have more Italian restaurants, but more modeled after Italian cities, buildings than almost any other city. So Munich is at the Isar River, which comes out of the Alps goes down, uh, there's also the Loisach River, and the canal, and it goes, flows into the Danube. And the reason why this was important is because salt was the gold of the Middle Ages. Salt, salt was more expensive than gold for a long time. And um, salt was transported along the rivers, and salt was needed to conserve food. Without salt, you couldn't keep food easily over, over the winter time. You could also use ice, but I'm a historian, so I have to show you a document. Even though I'm, there are some people who probably know much more about this, but I, in 1158, Munich is mentioned for the first time, and Frederick the First Barbarossa conferred, confirmed the, the transfer of toll and market rights to Munich. Basically, what happened is um, that um, they got a bridge at one point in time. Uh, before that, uh, Freising had the bridge and could ask for a toll. That makes you rich. As soon as you have a bridge and can ask people who pass through for a toll, you become rich. Can be a pirate. Here you see the Isar River. This is a later point when the Swedish army is going against Munich. The Isar River, in contrast to what you can see today, is very, it's, it's moving up and down a lot. And the other thing that you don't ne normally see when you walk around, you think everything is the same level, is that Munich is slightly higher than the river, quite a bit higher. And the highest point is this. This is a residence. If you go down uh, Ludwig and Leopoldstraße, you hit the residence on the left. So that's also where the fountain was, this oldest uh, fountain. Uh, you probably have seen it. I don't know. Most of you will have seen it. Um, so the river has these types of wooden bridges. This is 17th century. And the river like, uh, and the city like every medieval city looks like this. It has uh, a wall and gates here. This is the Isar Gate down here, the Sendlinger Tor in the south, etc. This is the Isar River um, here going down. And you, you, you can see that you can't even see where the river is. Is it this? Is it that? This, all of this is, is our river, and part of it goes into the city. The other thing you see here is the uh, residence garden, which is a very, it's a Renaissance garden, it's a very geometric, uh, an aristocratic garden that nobody can enter unless you're an aristocrat. <coughs> so the residence is here. Oops, and 
I didn't want to do that. Let me go forward. Okay. These rivers were important because without these rivers and without the, the, the wood, without the timber in uh, the Alps, you could not have built Munich. There would have been no, I mean, it's, it, there was plenty of wood. It was cheap. The only problem was how to transport it. It was damn dangerous. So you see some of these chapels in the, in the uh, Isar River or in the Loisach River where people prayed and thanked that they had survived a horrible storm. You, had to, you could take these, these uh, barges apart. Sometimes you had to take them apart and go around. Uh, and you could only go at certain times of the year. But um, what was transported was wood, but also charcoal. So wood for building and charcoal for energy. This is a little party. This is what they looked like. This you see the the symbol here in the back. It's a bit stylized. The Frauenkirche, the hundred meter high, uh, and barrels are being transported on the Isar River. This is the Gasthof in the Au. I think it's a it's a pub at the river. It's a party when the bargemen left. 1910, the start of the Bartman season, it was a big party because people did not know whether they would return. It was so dangerous, but also, I mean, they celebrated with beer. It's strange. This is Munich's coal island. Some of you know where the Deutsches Museum is, the largest German museum, the largest museum of technology in the world. It's on an island, and the island is coal island. Coal was charcoal. So these barges brought coal, charcoal, to the island where today the Deutsche Museum is. And this island here to be seen in, was in 1870s the largest barge harbor in the 1870s in the whole of Europe. So you can imagine uh, if you wonder, you know, where does this rise of Munich come from that you saw in the 19th century? You needed a lot of build, building materials and a lot of energy, and it really goes back to the, uh, to, there was the infrastructure, they had to build the infrastructure, they had to build this harbor. Bridges looked like this originally until the late 19th century. So the Munich bridges across the Isar were not stone bridges, they looked all like this. But there was a major disaster in 1899 and they were all gone after the storm. All the wooden bridges, that's when they decided to change things. Disasters change history. And then they, ca they, they canalized, channelized the river. So it's now 50 meters wide here instead of 100, and you have a concrete embankment instead of a wild natural embankment in order to protect from flooding. And in order to make sure that the, and you build these stone bridges. So all the bridges are since then made of stone. So nature is an actor, has an impact, not only as a resource, but also can actually act uh, like, like uh, can, can change the course of history. All of a sudden, you have to reinvent yourself. But people don't like this type of river that is so embanked today. People want to, we all prefer a wild river. We don't like this. This is a postcard. It's not, this, by the way, the, the parliament building. Um, this is the Deutsche Museum, I think. Uh, that's anyways that area. Why did I put that slide in? <clears throat> I think because rivers uh, are deviated and put. They, they are they are uh, used in the city for a number of reasons. You can see here for energy production, the water wheel. And there are these canals. This is one that still exists. It's the Auer Canal. Mühlbach. The Mühlbach. Oh, Mühlbach. So it's the mill stream. Um, so there are still historic mill streams, but most of the mill streams are gone. Because you can imagine that they had a horrible smell. They were used for sewage. And so they were put underground. This is the same site uh, on the left in 1907 and on the right today. You can walk through Sparkassenstraße. It's a, it's a, it's a, one of the oldest parts of Munich, and you can see that. Um, I mean, this was originally a, a canal that was used for uh, sewage 
and uh, for, some, for using water for almost every purpose, not necessarily for drinking. Uh, most of the drinking water came from wells. You can see here the. Um, this is a, this is a, a again that the mill stream flows through here. You see where the arrows are. The mill stream went through, is going through the whole city. In some places, it's under the ground. In some places, above the ground. But uh, there are waterworks in Munich, and they look beautiful. This one is very close to the Parliament building, and it's the same style, same architecture. So water was, you know, once once they established this water system, it became something very precious, and uh, not just a technical construction, but it's a. You can see this is actually uh, you can walk along here. It's in the English Garden. It's right next to the ESR, the waterwork here. And there are still quite a lot of waterworks. There's one gymnasium, one grammar school that produces its own energy through the water wheel. Now, people wanted to renaturalize because they hated this straight, tregated river. And so, oops. This is what it looked like. Note this tower back there. You can see the same tower here, it's the same picture. And it was an 11 year project with 2,000 excavators. It changed the ecosystem totally. So there are a lot of, there's now dead wood, there are now birds, there are now new types of fish, etc. So uh, it's a pride of the city. And um, also, people love to use this embankment, which is no longer a concrete embankment. It was a big, big project. And you might think there's nothing wrong with this. But there are problems. What could the problems be? I should have taken a photo of uh, people at the river in the summertime, because people are loving this beautiful river to death. Uh, it's incredible the amount of uh, plastic that goes down there uh, from these grills. You can probably tell us from the waste management. It's it's brutal. Bottles, a lot of glass, glass, glass bottles are the biggest problem because the people throw it anywhere on the gravel, yeah. and the next people go in barefoot. Yeah. Uh, and you know what happens. Yeah. Yeah. We were, uh, we had somebody from uh, uh, the Bavarian EPA here who explained to us that uh, there were these these one-time grills used at one point with aluminum and plastic, and people uh, used them once, and there was enormous. Toxic material yeah. in in the going down to the Alps. Uh, I mean, not down to the Alps, going the other way, but uh, in the Isar River. But it's there's another thing that you don't see. You may think this is a natural river, but the reality is that this is built. The pillar is standing on an artificial island, and it's standing on this island to make sure that the river, when the water masses come, does not uh, destroy the bridge. So it's really a manufactured river. It looks natural, but there is hidden behind it is total uh, artificiality. The new basis for rivers. This looks like um, a beautiful path, all natural. But the problem are these trees, because these trees are causing erosion, and they can they can move into the river. And so there's a, there's this danger that if they move into the river, they uh, they uh, the whole island here is gone. And therefore, what they have done, and you can't see it, but I show you, is this. They dug down, this is 40 centimeters, they dug down one meter, uh, put down concrete to stabilize the bankment. Is this a natural river, or is it a manufactured river? Is it any better than what that was before with the concrete? Um, it's definitely something that people appreciate. They love it, and um, it's something to discuss. Munich, if you want to make money, you just need to fill your bottle with Munich water. <laughs> you can call it Aqua Monaco. Monaco means Munich in Italian. Um, and um, it's supposedly the best water in Germany. The reason why the water comes from the Alps and why you could fill it up in bottles and sell it for a lot of money, I think this costs probably five euros. Um, is that in 1870, well, there were, there were several typhus and cholera epidemic, epidemics. 
uh, in the 1840s, 1850s. But in 1872, something happened that didn't happen before. Not only did 400 people die, but one of them was the princess. And Munich is very monarchical, very aristocratic. Even today, I would say it's important. I think what uh, uh, the princess, the uh, oldest of the princesses, she's been to the castle center a few times. She's an important figure here. Um, and she's an ornithologist. And so aristocracy plays a role. Anyways, the death of the princess, sounds like a novel. Uh, the death of the princess made the uh, government rethink where they get the water from because they knew that it was spoiled and they needed to get it from elsewhere and they got it from the Mangfall. This is the Mangfall. This, this river is the Mangfall. And they get it, this is the Alps. This is where it starts, the Mangfall. So it's really fresh. Where it's mostly from this area. And then it flows. These are the, the blue ones are the, the pipes. They go into Munich all these ways. There are a few other options. There's one option from Oberau, close to Garmisch, a long one. But almost all of the water comes, almost 50% comes from this little area in the Mangfang Valley. Um, this, by the way, up here is not the Mangfang Valley. This is the, the gravel plain north of Munich. So they, if there is a shortage of water, they use some water from the gravel plain. Almost everything comes from the Mangfang Valley, and again, this architecture. It's beautiful valley. This water is pumped up all the way to Munich. And the reason why I'm showing you these cows is there is a totally delicate and fascinating relationship between the city of Munich and the Mangfall uh, communities, because they have to provide good water, so they can't use chemicals in the agriculture. They also can't just uh, suburbanize the way they like. They can't just build. They have to make sure that they always have to, there's a contract between these communities and the city of Munich. Uh, to make sure that the water is provided. You can imagine what tension that is. And I mentioned before, Munich is progressive, the countryside is conservative. You hate the Munich capital people who are rich and working these insurances and reinsurances and in the BMW factories and all these places. Or in the universities, they are just snobby. And, uh, and you are uh, an agriculturalist. You can't use the, the, the fertilizer that everybody else uses because it's transported to Munich. So there, are some, there is some tension. Now we come to the most important thing, beer. Um, most of the trees in beer gardens are which trees? Chestnut. Do you think? It's not linden. Chestnut. What is that in English? Chestnut. Chestnut, chestnut. chestnut. exactly. Why chestnut? Shade. Shade. It's good against rain and it's good against uh, uh, the sun. But why is it important that uh, the beer gardens are shaded, not just because of the people? There's another reason. Keeps the beer cool. The cooling. Cooling off? Cooling. Yeah. Cellars down. Off? The cellars down. So the cellars, yeah. Because most of the beer gardens had cellars. Oh, you are here. <laughs> you could have given that talk. That's so embarrassing. I'm, I'm happy I didn't see you. <laughs> she knows she, she will correct everything I said before. Anyways, I tell you that it's really, I'm, I'm, I'm telling this story because in environmental history, I think it's really interesting to look at trees, to look at, I mean, Munich is searching for its future tree. Which tree should it be? It has to have, uh, is in the times of climate change, it will have to be a, a tree that can stand the heat. Uh, they don't want the linden tree because of the, because the shit of the, of the little insects. Uh, ends up on the windshields. People hate it. So it used to be, you know, before, before cars, it was not a problem. But now with windshields, everybody hates it. So a lint tree is out. Uh, oak has other problems. And it needs, to be a, it needs to be a sturdy tree. It needs to be a tree that uh, dogs can pee on and it, the, the tree doesn't die. So they are in search of this one for all trees. Probably they need multiple trees because they don't know what happens in 50 or 100 years. Trees take a hundred years to grow, and uh, so. But it's a big debate, you know, which trees. But here in the beer garden, it's clear that the, the chestnut has these big leaves, and it covers, um, it cools the beer. So what do you need for beer? You need. Meat. What? Hops. Hops. Barley. Barley. Water. Malt. Water. Malt comes from. 
father. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> but it's the same. It's just, uh, so you just need three ingredients, uh, hops, barley, and a hot, hot, uh, hops, malt, and water. Hops grows north of Munich because it's colder there. Um, and with climate change, it may well be possible. I mean, you know, there's now hops growing in Finland. There's hops growing. Uh, the biggest hops fields in the world used to be just north of here, the Tetnanger hop, Hopfen um, in the world. But now I think they're somewhere in North America. I think in Oregon, Washington, that area is the biggest hops fields. And uh, they will be moving because of climate change. They will be moving north. And it could well be that Munich, like in the Middle Ages, when the climate was hotter, uh, there could be wine growing again one day. And beer beer is now, OK, we have hops in this area. Not so far. That was good. We have very good water in the area. But we also have gravel. So it's easy to dig down and create uh, these basements to store beer. And then the other thing they might need is ice. Several of the farms here, like the Landhaus, where our fellows come from, they have a they have an ice house. So you bring uh, the ice on the rivers, and you so you can store things. I mean, you, you remember you need, you need salt for to preserve the food, but you also need uh, ice to cool it over uh, the summertime. And so it's good that there's there's a lot of snow in the area even though it's getting less and less and less. By the way, you can bring your own food to the beer garden. Um, you don't have to eat the food there. Uh, there are all sorts of ancient laws that apply. Um, some of you have seen this, um, this ice brook. It's really ice cold. There are these, you've seen it, yeah, they're the naked jugglers and the surfers and <laughs> the English garden. Um, it's really cold water, uh, but it's great in this weather. It's alpine water. This is the English garden here. Um, you can see the difference between this garden, which is the residency garden. Uh, this, is the resident, this is the palace of the king. Um, we are somewhere north here. Don't quite see it, we may be here. So this is the English garden in expense here. Originally, it was given in the 18th century. It was actually, it's an English garden that was done by an American. And um, he worked for the king and was in charge of the soldiers. And uh, the, the king was not very, uh, didn't have a lot of money for the soldiers. And so the or origins of the English garden, at least one of the origins, is that the uh, soldiers were planting their own vegetables. Um, some say potatoes, but in the beginning, I think it was mainly radishes, these types of, um, how do you call it, rüben. Um, anyways, um, typical sturdy, sturdy uh, uh, vegetables. And they, uh, well, originally it was aristocratic, it was a hunting ground. Then part of it was given to the soldiers, and then it was given to the public. What I find interesting about this park, uh, and when you walk through it, you will watch just around the corner from here. What you can see, oops, what you can see here, oops, what you can see here is that there are all these, well, this is a Nazi building. Uh, they, uh, there are all these paths. They don't, they're not geometric. Uh, and there is, there's even a little ice brook. This is the ice brook. And then you can see that it's, there are trees all around. You will have some vistas. So you walk through the park, and you will see, intriguingly, all of a sudden you see, oh, there's a pagoda. There's a pagoda over there. There's a beer garden for 5,000 people with a pagoda, Chinese pagoda. Ho Shen will say this is not Chinese. It was actually built in the 18th century. It was uh, rebuilt after the war because it was damaged. But um, you, you walk through the, the, through the park, and you have this. It's a landscape park, so it's picturesque. And uh, it should give you this, this mode. You, you should be wandering around like in a, in a, to discover things, the beauty. And you should feel that you're in the, in the countryside, in a sort of a manicured, beautiful countryside away from urban life. And uh, everything is not accidental. It looks like it's nature, but it's all choreographed nature. So um, this, 
you should remember because there's a difference between this type of park and the Olympic Park. The Olympic Park is made from rubble from World War II. <coughs> so this is what Munich looked like, almost all was destroyed. All what you see is here rebuilt. And um, this park here is Olympic Stadium. Um, 1972. 1972 made all the difference. This is, um, but we're actually also part of this climate protest, so it's being appropriated by by climate activists, uh, the Olympic Park. But um, what I find interesting about this park is that it was planned in contrast to the English Garden, not as a park where you are closed off, where you close the city off. The Olympic Park was planned in a what they the plan is called democratic as a democratic park. Um, even though the landscape plan at Chimic was very corrupted by the Nazis. Uh, this is uh, Frei Otto and Benisch planned the stadium here, this stadium, which by the way looks like it's a tent. Uh, the roof has to be exchanged all the time. Uh, it's preserved, it's, of course it's a landmark. Um, but what is interesting here, you can see uh, all these towers, you can see industry, you can see the city. So the idea is after Nazi Germany, in 1972, Munich is opening up to the world with the Olympic Games. They're saying, let's leave the aristocratic path behind us, the past behind us. Let's leave the Nazi past behind us. Let's leave this shutting off of the privileged behind us. Let's open the grounds so we can see all around. Uh, we can see that um, we are real, we are democracy. We have nothing to hide. This was the, this was the ideology behind this type of park. Okay, now I come to my final thing, how green is Munich? Could be very, you could imagine that it's very green, there's solar panels on the parliament roof. There is this, oh, you know this. We know it. You were in charge of this building. Yeah. This is the first fermenta dry fermentation plant in Europe, yeah? Yeah, one of the first. Not the first, but one of the first. Okay, 25,000 tons of organic waste transformed into heated energy. When was that, 1990? 2007. 2007. So there is something to be proud of here, even though we are we have coal power outside of Munich, which is a real problem, and even the green government was not able to get rid of the coal power uh, for energy. Here is a green belt surrounding the city, which is very very expensive. We had a project with our students, and they worked out how much one square meter, uh, how much rent a pumpkin would have to pay. <laughs> Five, five years ago for one square meter. How much do you think they would have to pay for one square meter in rent? 150 euro. Good guess. Another guess? 150 is not a, not a bad guess. I think today it would be more because of inflation. <laughs> <laughs> and because high prices have gone up quite a bit, but it's 500. <laughs> so think twice if you have an urban garden here. <laughs> This is, I mentioned before, curiosities. This is one of the weirdest things. There are two churches. The oldest church of Munich, it's the village of Röttmanning that is hidden below this mountain, under this mountain. You see the, the football stadium in the back. But strangely, there are two churches. They look alike. One is rebuilt. If you go in the original one, and you light a match, it will explode. Because there is, this is a mountain of waste that was started after World War II, and people just loaded all the waste up, up there, and so the, the toxic broth uh, will light up. And the village was dissolved because they needed the space for, I mean, it was in the north of Munich, right next to Allianz, up to Alina. And it looks like Munich is green, but the toxic broth has to be pumped up all the time so it doesn't go into the, into the, into, into the uh, every day, yeah? yeah? All the time. It's good to have the head of the waste disposal <laughs> here. Uh, this is what nice. it looked like. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice uh, location. It's Deponie Gas, and it looks green. You know, you've got a landscape park. You've got the only wind wheel of Munich is on top of that. Can you imagine? We have two now. Two? You've got two. Yeah, on the other landfill, we also have a <laughs> <laughs> 
every landfill gets a windmill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is this is what it looked like when they when they um, started it and, um, next to the autobahn. It's a nice hiking area. You wouldn't know. Um, I just looked it up. 2022. Munich was the number one in nitrogen dioxide of all the cities. So it's a green city. The auto lobby won out in the city. There was a big, you know, back and forth between the cycle lobby. The city called itself the, the Radlhauptstadt, the cycle, cycle capital. Because many people are cycling here and they have some cycle paths, blah, blah. But um, under the, not this government, but one of the previous government under Ude, there was a big fight between the, the, the car lobby and the cycle lobby, and uh, the, they, there, was a, there was a foul compromise in the end, so both of them didn't win. Neither won. It's, uh, but the city gave up calling themselves the cycle capital. Anyways, uh, you can see here, this was uh, earlier 2016, Munich and Stuttgart, Leonberg were the only three cities that had the highest amount of um, um, nitrogen dioxide. I think now, uh, I think, did, was it Felbach and Munich? Munich is the number one in Germany. Perhaps no wonder, BMW. And uh, so this BMW, this is, this is a tunnel, and this is the, the beltway that was built in 1972. So in 1972, everything changed. Remember, the population numbers went up. There was... Uh, there were uh, new underground stations built, and the beltway, what's it called here? The Mittler Ring was built. The Ring Road was built around Munich so that they could get all these people for the Olympics from all over the world to the city because it didn't have the infrastructure. It was never, nobody could, would have imagined that it could be a city of 1.8 million. It's ridiculous. It's not like Berlin with wide streets. And there's bicycle culture. It has the highest number, Munich has the highest number of public transportation commuters, the largest bicycle network. And there are demonstrations for cyclists with Green City. You can join them. It's an NGO. Um, I'm a member. If you're a member, you can cycle around with these funny vehicles. You can even, uh, there are even bike fashion shows. You don't have that in many parts of the world. And then there are free uh, cargo bikes. And you can even borrow, if you're a member of Green City, you can even borrow trees on wheels and put them in your street to see what it would be like. Green City also advises you on climate, cooling your facade. So is it a green city? There are many, many innovative things about it. It's, it's fascinating, not just the dry fermentation plant and the, the solar panels on the, there's a, I mean, the city wants to be CO2 neutral originally by 2030, now by 2050, maybe they will never reach it, but um, there are a lot of grassroots initiatives and Green City is a membership organization. It has other arms. Uh, part, some, of, some of them are actually very commercial, so they, they make sure that they make money with uh, clean energy, for instance. They are bankrupt. They went bankrupt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think I've reached my final slide. Because there are some, even, we had an exhibition in this area, in this building, with, in the center of the city. It's up here somewhere, um, with sheep on the roof. In theory, you could visit it. If you went up the stairs, you would pass a 40 meters of an ant alleyway. Ants going up the staircase, uh, and you can see through the through the plastic tube. And on top, you would find some sheep grazing. Um, this is supposed to become a cool area. I think it's going to be gentrified relatively soon. But the idea behind it was that you have workshops, you have these containers for music and for artists. You've got a white, what's it called, the white space, where we had our exhibition. We had our Ecopolis exposition there. Um, and um, so there are, um, a friend of mine, he uh, read in the newspaper that the owner of this works, they had to move out. It was a potato dumpling factory. You know, potato dumplings, very important for Germans. <laughs> and in World War II, the guy who uh, had was was working on potatoes, had the idea to produce dumplings. So that he basically just took the water out of the potato and put it in bags, and it was really a ration for the soldiers. And it became a big thing after the war, and it made him rich. This is where his factory was. You can still see 
the, the potato, these canals where they wash the potatoes. I saw these old photographs of farmers bringing the potatoes to that area. It's this area, but they had to move out uh, to make this a residential area and a business area. And uh, for instance, there's a hotel. There will be an opera place, I think. There's a hotel and has the same entrance as the youth hostel. So a luxury hotel and a youth hostel. So the idea is to be innovative, to be progressive, to mix people, to mix uh, artists with um, you know, the, with restaurants and with all sorts of, so it's a, it's a very diverse area. It can be cool, there's also a, a big wheel now. Um, the longer you wait, the less cool it will be, but it still could be still cool for you to go there at night, I don't know. Okay, so there is more to discover, and you should all, if you want, take uh, one of our um, Ecopolis Munich uh, booklets, which um, is outside in the foyer. And uh, now we did this exhibition with the students, with our master and certificate students, in two spots in the Werksviertel, in the potato dumpling place, mm -hmm. and also in the main building of the university. And right now it's actually in a fascinating place. I think it may still be there. It's in the food hub. So the food hub is, is like a cool space of an insurance company that is empty. It has been empty for a few years now. It's huge. And there are all sorts of uh, there, there are actors in it. There are bike repair shops. Uh, there are, um, uh, but there's the food hub is it's a place. Share. Yeah, it's not the food. The share. It's called share. S H A E R E. And uh, what's it called? The food. Community kitchen. Sorry, the food hub is something else. It's another alternative concept. So it's the uh, community kitchen. Uh, where they only use food that would have been thrown away otherwise. And so that's where the Ecopolis uh, exhibition should be now. You could visit it, but you can also just uh, take a catalog, look at it, it's in German and in English, and uh, there are things to discover. For, like, for instance, in the underground station here, during World War II, they planted mushrooms. And we experimented with that as well because we realized that, and it works, mushrooms don't need light. Anyways, I have reached the end, and I want to thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>